It's another IK Advances special, today sponsored by Private Internet Access with an exclusive four month free deal for my audience at privateinternetaccess.com forward slash Dave. More on that later, but today we're talking iPhone 14 release, Apple's business essentials, CF versus SD cards, Apple Silicon upgrades for current Mac Pros, Mac Mini Pro versus Mac Pro, data centers running Apple Silicon, lightning to Thunderbolt iPhone cables, modern internals in vintage Macs, iPhones powering a desktop OS, USB-C versus portless iPhones, MagSafe HomePods, Apple modems and Threadripper Macs, Space Cray trackpads, dual wielding HomePods, archiving iPhone videos, how this channel started, M1X music plug-in issues and more, so I guess we'd better get started. Let's go. I'm Mike Cave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple leaks, news and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell. And there's a little personal update for me at the end of the video, so stay tuned for that too. First question comes from Levi Manning, hashtag iCave Answers. When is the iPhone 14 coming out? Release date. And it's great to start with a nice easy one. This is going to be September next year. That is pretty much the, the only year we've had a problem with this is 2020. So fingers crossed there's no massive uh, international catastrophe in 2022. Uh, and assuming that's the case... September 2022, we should be seeing our next iPhone, the iPhone 14 with that sexy, sexy new design. And Joe asks, IK Vances, do you think Apple Business Essentials is a thing that will take off? It's the small business service that I'm referring to. And yes, Apple Business Essentials is a brand new service that they've just launched, which is kind of like iCloud for business. Um, it's for small and medium uh, companies up to, I think it's 500 employees, something along those lines. But it's Apple describes it as one complete subscription that seamlessly brings together device management, 24-7 support, and iCloud storage. So your small business can easily manage every employee's iPhone, iPad, and Mac every step of the way. In the past, I can see why Apple hasn't done anything like this. There's not been a huge number of companies that are rolling out Macs to large numbers of employees in the same way that Windows does um, there's certainly been companies that have done it. But now with the uh, Apple Silicon MacBook Air, this is a, a system that's going to last for, I don't know, five years at least. Windows laptops in uh, work environments probably last three to four at best. Um, it actually makes a lot of sense for businesses to roll these things out, have um, a much better experience for their uh, employees. And now with Apple supporting it with things like this Apple Business Essentials program, I think it's going to do really well. Next up, Joe asks, IK Vances, do you think CF Express will replace the SD card slot? Calm down, Joe, we've only just got SD cards back. This is this is kind of my whole problem with the SD card coming back in the first place, to be completely honest. I feel like Apple's thrown in this SD card reader because so many people shouted about it without actually thinking through why is it a good thing to have. Um, and I understand that people like MKBHD probably use an external audio recorder that uses an SD card to record to, but it's also like it's not the biggest issue in the world to have an SD card reader that you plug into a USB-C spot that keeps, that keeps the port um, versatile because you're now just assuming that SD is the standard that everyone uses, and uh, yeah, I don't think many people actually do these days. I think there's far more people that are using their iPhones as their point-and-shoot camera. I think there's a lot less people using a camera that needs to put an SD card into their Mac. That being said, the people that are using a bigger camera are more likely to be using either an SD card or a CF Express card in order to um, transfer their footage. Again, there's there's a lot of places there's a lot of ways out there that you can use a USB C cable to transfer this footage to. You can either plug it directly into the camera or you can uh, plug in a card reader that reads the cards that you actually need into a USB C slot. Arthur Swart asks, IK Vances, what are your thoughts on PCIe Apple Silicon cards for the Intel Mac Pro towers ever being released? Two customers are considering taking a twenty thousand dollar write off for their Mac Pros in favour of an M1 Max device. I think a PCIe card would never come as it allows the Hackintosh community a way into Apple Silicon that Apple would frown upon. And yes, the the Hackintosh issue is one that I hadn't really considered. I'd mentioned before, I think it would be something that Apple would be able to do to be able to produce a card that slots into the existing Mac Pros to take advantage of the RAM in there to basically use the Intel processors as kind of a secondary networked farm that it would be able to send certain tasks to to be processed in the background. However, you make a very good point. The Hackintosh community can already kind of set up its systems to look like a Mac Pro. So what would stop them plugging in one of these PCIe cards and and using Apple Silicon 
in a Hackintosh environment. That is a, a very good point. However, I think the whole operating system would basically be running on these Apple Silicon cards. Um, so essentially you are buying an Apple Silicon Mac if you buy the card to slot into a Mac Pro. I mean, I'm sure that Apple would be able to make it very difficult for people to do that, but, uh, and, and maybe just simply lock it down to exactly the, the chips that they offer in the Mac Pros. And maybe there's some sort of secure enclave built into the Mac Pro logic board that we're not aware of that, uh, you know, do they use a T2 in the, uh, in the Mac Pros right now? If they do, that could be the way that it, uh, the way that it identifies that it's in a genuine Mac. I don't know. Uh, I did think to myself, oh, it's fine. They'll use the MPX modules, but MPX modules just use PCIe. So it's not as, uh, not as difficult as I thought, but yeah, I would love to see it. Uh, but I, as you say, I think it might open the Apple Silicon environment up to Hackintoshing. Next up, Arthur Swart, IK Vances. Do you think that the delay on the M1 Pro Max Mini might be a strategic move to get sales first onto the Apple Silicon Mac Pros? I think that if the, if the Mac Pro Max Mini becomes available before the Mac Pro, many potential Mac Pro buyers will have gotten themselves a maxed out Mini already, or could the Mini Max just be the new Mac Pro? Apple, please sort your names out. A Max Mini Mac Mac Pro Pro Mini Max Pro. It's it's terrible. But moving on, we know what the question is. Will the Mini with the new chips cannibalize sales of the Mac Pro? I don't think so. Uh, I think that the people that are wanting the Mac Pro will get the Mac Pro because the Mac Pro is the one that's going to be able to have probably a terabyte of RAM, uh, a terabyte of unified memory. Um, whereas the Mac Mini, even with the Pro chips, is going to be going up to 64 gigabytes. That's a big gap. That's not that's not an inconsequential gap. And yes, 64 gigabytes acts a lot bigger than it, it really is on Apple Silicon, but a terabyte is still going to act a lot bigger than that too. So I don't think that that's going to be an issue. And I also I also think that the uh, the Mac Pro with the multiple M1 SOCs, the multiple M1 Pro or Max SOCs, it's just going to be a completely different beast when you're getting into 128 or more GPU cores. Okay, Vances, did you see that Apple is now offering a business essential service? Do you think Apple will make a server class product for data centers and cloud companies? Their systems are extremely power efficient, which is a big cost driver. The added output would also give Apple an added revenue to finance a yearly TikTok upgrade cycle of their higher end M series processors. Their advantage over the others is that they are probably TSMC's biggest client and their tech in ARM based systems is not really matched in the server space and could be the gorilla in the space, which it sounds like Nvidia is trying to enter as well. And I see where you're coming from with this. Um, but Apple right now, where they're using servers, is not using their own silicon. They're not using Apple Silicon in the servers that power things like iCloud and that sort of stuff. I don't think that Apple has any real interest in going into this. I don't think that the revenue that they would get from it would be significant. Let's be honest, Apple is not short of the money to develop these uh, systems. They have basically the highest revenues in the world. They have the first or second highest market capitalization in the world. If they needed money to develop these, they've got it. That's not a limiting factor for Apple. Um, what is the limiting uh, factor is probably the amount of high level engineers that they can get hold of. And also that Apple likes to keep their teams small within development. They don't like to have big sprawling teams. I think the, the rule of thumb is that you should be able to, um, you should be able to feed an entire meeting on a couple of pizzas. I think that's pretty much how they work. So um, I don't think that that's the limiting factor. I think, yes, it would make um, cool server hardware, but Apple also makes far more profit by selling consumer devices direct to the consumers. There's a much bigger profit margin in them. Uh, and I think at least for now, while there is a chip shortage, that is probably the way that Apple will stay. James Apple asks, could Apple make a lightning to Thunderbolt 4 cable for future iPhones? For data transfer and all that jazz with ProRes video on the 14 Pro and 14 Max families of Pro iPhones. They could. Uh, I've got a feeling they won't. I'm, I am I still just kind of come back to the fact that Apple doesn't particularly like cabling stuff together. Like, we've, we've moved over to MagSafe um, because they don't like to plug stuff into other things. Uh, we've moved over to MagSafe on the Macs 
uh, again, we've moved to MagSafe Pucks on the iPhones. I just feel like Apple is trying to move us towards that wireless future. And although, yes, we've got the MacBook Pros that have now got the option to plug into stuff when you need to, um, iCloud is still their way of doing storage. Um, they're making, like, internal storage is not cheap from Apple. So they're encouraging people to use cloud storage. They're encouraging people to be connected all the time. Uh, so I don't feel like this is the way that they're going to do. I feel like AirDrop is good. Uh, and as Wi-Fi gets quicker, which it constantly is, AirDrop will get quicker too. And I understand that if you're using a Windows system, AirDrop isn't an option for you. And sorry, get a Mac. And that is possibly uh, Apple's argument too. If you are doing enough with video editing to have very fast transfer speeds. If you're making a movie, for example, which I know has been an example kicked around, and you wanna use ProRes on the iPhones, then you're gonna have the budget to get a $699 base level Mac Mini that you can use as an ingest server over AirDrop to get your files from the iPhones to whatever your editing server is, where you're gonna keep your footage. That makes just enough sense that for 700 bucks, you've got a really quick way of getting all the footage off of your iPhones onto your server. Tim Kinetics asks, IK Vances, if you could have any historic Apple product in any form factor with modern internals, which one would you have? And this is a really cool question. Like my favorite um, Apple kind of form factor of all time is the Mac uh, G4 Cube, which is a dumb idea because <laughs> It's just a box that sits on your desk, but it's so beautiful. Um, and I would have obviously modern internals. We'll just call it M1 Max and it doesn't matter about calling. Um, I would love to have a Power Mac G4 Cube that had an M1 Max in it. That would be awesome. I also think one of the big old G4 Sunflower uh, iMacs would be amazing. I think they had up to 20 inch displays. That would be really cool to have as a current iMac. But if I was on the go, I think the G3 iBook, this bad boy, that's going to take some beating for flexing in uh, Starbucks. Mine Dutch course asks, IK for answers. What do you think about a housing solution which could make the f iPhone a lower end Mac mini type device with some more connectors? And yes, a Mac OS partition. So I guess here we're talking about the equivalent of like a Samsung DeX or something along those lines, which basically uses the, um, the internals of your phone as your processor in order to use it as a desktop kind of operating system. So yeah, you're saying that we should have like a Mac OS partition on an iPhone and then when you plug the iPhone into some sort of dock, you can then use it at a desk with a keyboard and trackpad, I guess. Um, in fact, the iPhone could probably be your trackpad. That would be pretty cool. I think it would be great, but I also don't really know how many people would use it because, purely because when Samsung did it, Barely anyone used it. Um, it could be that the apps just weren't optimized and would we then be having to have multiple versions of the app built into the iPhone so that you can use it on a desktop and on a, like as a phone operating system. I feel like there's just gonna be like so many little quirks that don't quite work. And if, you, if you're stuck with the file system from the iPhone and you can't use like Finder, I don't feel like it would be practical. I do feel like it would be awesome uh, and if people actually used it, that would be great. But I've got a feeling that people just wouldn't. Idiot with Internet asks, IK Vances, in some perfect alternate timeline where Apple does end up putting USB-C on iPhone, do you think they would go portless and then add USB-C maybe to just the pros? Then there's not two different connection types in just a few generations. I I'm not quite sure why you think that the USB-C future in an iPhone is perfect. Um, I, I don't feel like we're suffering right now. I don't understand why everyone is so fed up with lightning. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, that being said, I don't think they would go to portless and then go back to USB-C. That doesn't make any sense either. If there's anything other than going to portless, I think it will be that Apple will make lightning faster on the phone. Uh, I don't think that they are gonna just switch to USB-C. There is a possibility, I guess. And, and the only thing that will make them do it is if they are legally compelled to do it. I can't see them just deciding you know what? Yeah, USB-C is great, even though Apple basically invented it. Greg Robel asks, IK Vances, what do you think of an, the idea of a HomePod Mini with a built-in MagSafe charger for your phone? Yes, yes, 100% yes. I think basically everything should have MagSafe chargers built into it. Uh, right from back in 
you know, before Apple Silicon even arrived and we were talking about iMacs getting um, refurbished and redesigned when Apple Silicon arrived, I said the foot of the iMac should have a MagSafe puck in it. As soon as we actually saw the first MagSafe, I was like, yep, we should have wireless charging built into the foot of the iMac and that should also be what charges your trackpad, your mouse, because it would fix the magic mouse problem. It would be a great place to just pop your iPhone. It could have uh, the, the Apple Watch Series 7 style um, near field communication that then turns into a data transfer as well. That would be great. Um, and actually that's probably what they will do with MagSafe eventually. For everyone that's complaining about not being able to plug into CarPlay, you will plug in a MagSafe um, adapter into your CarPlay port, into the USB port, and then you will stick your iPhone to it and that will be your tra data transfer. That's how CarPlay will move across. That is how you will transfer data. It's going to be via MagSafe, I'm pretty sure. Jim Frank the Third asks, IK answers, when do you think Apple's 5G modems will come in the iPhone and why not put AMD Threadripper into the Mac Pro? Okay, first one first, uh, the Apple modems probably going to be next year. Um, I think the first ones will probably come in an iPad rather than an iPhone because of scale. Um, but if Apple was to put their own modems into the iPhone uh, and take out the Qualcomm modems, that is actually a massive cost saving probably for Apple. Uh, yes, it will cost a lot in R&D, but at the moment, I think when uh, Apple moved over to using 5G modems in the iPhone 12, from Qualcomm, it was something like $150 worth of the total price was just this modem chip. So Apple could save a huge amount there if they can get that R&D up to speed. And you know that they're not gonna drop it if it's just the same speed as what Qualcomm can do. It's gonna be better somehow or lower power or something along those lines. In terms of Threadripper Mac Pros, if we were staying on x86, I would 100% agree. Um, the reason that Apple stayed with Intel for so long was contractually, I think. However, the the fact that we're now moving to Apple Silicon, the uh, the Apple Silicon Mac Pro is absolutely going to annihilate Threadripper chips. I would almost guarantee. Alina asks, IK answers, hi, do you think Apple is going to bring out a space gray version of the new trackpad, even using USB-C? USB-C, no. Um, that's almost certainly not going to happen. I think, uh, if anything, if they do change the connection type, it will be going to MagSafe so that you can pop it on a puck and you can charge it from that. However, trackpads in Space Gray, quite possibly when we get more Pro devices. Um, I don't think it would necessarily come with the MacBook Pros, but when we start to get desktop Pro Max, that's probably when we'll get it. Martin Kowalczyk asks, IK, IK Vances, hashtag new threat, hashtag Apple jokes. Would stacking two HomePod minis on top of each other, one upside down, provide a double spatial audio experience? No. But they do make a pretty cool stereo pair, so it kind of gives you a bit of spatial, but uh, the, the thing with the HomePod minis is that they have a single speaker inside, so it's very difficult to get anything really spatial out of those things. The original HomePods were just so much further advanced, seven tweeters and one uh, base, what are they called? Woofers. One woofer inside. Um, those things were just like a million miles more advanced than what we have now, which is sad, but nobody bought them at the time. And now that they're gone, everyone wants them. So the prices secondhand have gone sky high. I will keep a lookout because I would love to own one. Thomas Rabenstein asks, IK Vances, thanks for sharing your insights on your w YouTube workflow. I'm also in the process of setting up a YouTube channel. Congratulations. And I'm glad to hear that the iPhone can be a good recording device. I'd be interested to know how you back up your raw video data as I'm sure it gets very large collection over time. Um, so two ways, uh, primarily I use the biggest iCloud plan. So I'm on the, the premier Apple One plan, um, which shares across our family, but nobody else really creates a great deal of video. So we've got two terabytes of iCloud storage, which is the automatic backup system. Um, so it, it moves automatically from my iPhone into the cloud. Uh, I also then airdrop the files to my Mac and they live on the internal 256 tiny little storage drive. Um, and then every so often when my internal drive starts to get a bit full, I have a six terabyte spinning drive that sits underneath the desk and ruins my audio when I forget to turn it off uh, during recordings. Um, but I just basically switch that on, dump all the files across to it, switch it off again. That's, uh, that's my backup method and it's probably not a particularly safe one, but I also, because all of this stuff is news, doesn't really matter, 
because it's all saved on YouTube too. Team Kinetics asks, iCave answers, as there's another tech drought, can you tell the new subscribers what made you start an Apple tech channel? And also, David Black asks, I gave answers. Dave, as you shared your workflow process and took us behind the scenes here, I wonder if you could go further and discuss how it came to be that you decided to run an Apple-centered YouTube channel. This could not have been easy given that you've got a full-time job in another line of work and a young family. What led to your deep knowledge of Apple and moreover, your decision to do commentary and produce these videos? What did you hope to add to the existing tech and Apple-focused channels available on YouTube? Thanks, a fan and follower from British Columbia, Canada. Cool, so quick quick backstory. This is like the episode, you know, issue one comic book of me. Um, I've been a bartender, been in the bar industry since about 2000, started throwing bottles around in nightclubs, uh, and then ended up over the years, went, worked out in Dubai, uh, came over to the UK, worked in the wholesale side of things. And uh, obviously during lockdown, not a great deal going on in the bar industry. Uh, I ended up starting this as a bit of a fill my time during lockdown thing uh, last year, and it took off pretty well. Now, it turns out that my uh, employment with that uh, drinks company ended last week. So uh, I'm now just on this at the moment. Uh, it's not going to be sustainable. So there is some other stuff in the works, um, but we will come to that later. The reason that I did it and the reason that I thought I could do differently is um, I've been a moderator for Gary Vaynerchuk over on his Facebook page and learned a lot from Team Gary V on how to manage communities and how to um, kind of engage a lot more. And I think that's what a lot of YouTubers are missing, not specifically in the tech space, but in general, uh, is that people don't communicate well with their audiences. And that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about. We are, I think, past 2 million views on the channel now. And I respond to every single comment that is in the comment section. Uh, like that's that was my intention from day one. And when we had 100 subscribers, that was quite simple. Now we've got 10,000. It's not as easy. It takes a bit more time. Um, but I'm focused on being a part of the community, talking to you guys. This is why we were able to do the IKversary and have people like John Prosser and Luke Miani and Brian Tong and a bunch of other people, uh, Constant Geekery, uh, and all those guys actually come on the show uh, and, and chat because we've made a little bit of a, a dent. We've made a bit of an impact in the community, and that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I really value you guys. You are the reason that I'm doing this. Um, and it is getting towards the point where it could be a job. Uh, but right now it's not, so I need to look for what's next on the job front as well. And finally, Andre Louis asks, Hello Dave, bought myself a 64 gig M1 Max and everything runs well apart from a few music plugins. I've made certain that everything is up to date and the same thing happened with the M1 on first release, so I'm not too worried about it yet, but it falls over with some projects where the M1 Classic doesn't. Have you heard of any audio producers having problems? I imagine this will be fixed with a 12.02 or 12.1 release, but it's concerning to have spent this much money on a system that's failing me at the moment. P.S. New buyers, please don't be put off by my situation. It's very niche and I expect early adopter teething problems. I must stress that, I must stress that first and foremost. P.S. Huge congratulations on 10k subs. Huge fan of the channel and I wish you a prosperous and long-lasting YouTube future. And I have to say, Andre, um, we've been chatting for quite some time on Twitter and uh, you are a great supporter of the channel so thank you very much. So in terms of the glitches it is always going to be a little bit of an issue when something brand new comes out that uh, that different software developers haven't quite got their heads around it and it's not going to be a structural thing in the way that it was with M1. Uh, I think it's going to be more of a ah there's just a switch we need to flick over here we need to enable this tag something like that it shouldn't take too long but what i would encourage you to do is reach out immediately to the plugin producers and let them know that you're having an issue because it might be that they're unaware of it so if you have any issues with any software with a new mac or a new update to an operating system make sure that the producers of that software of that plugin know that you're having the issue that's the first step because if they don't know that it's there it might take a lot longer to get fixed. Um, it's very difficult for um, it's very difficult for people to fix a problem that they don't know about, and it's also very difficult for developers to have every single version of every single piece of equipment uh, in order to test against. Now they should be able to do it in Xcode where they simulate different devices, but it, there's always going to be some differences when you simulate versus running it on the physical hardware. So uh, that would be my uh, best suggestion. 
other than that, I hope you're really enjoying the, uh, the M1 Max. It should be a pretty awesome bit of kit for you. Today's sponsor is Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. It's a simple to use VPN that works with your Mac, iPhone, iPad, and even those PC things and Android phones, routing all of your traffic through a secure tunnel to hide your IP address and keep what you're doing private. And let's be honest, if you're watching this video, you're probably using the devices you are because you value your privacy. Private Internet Access hides your network data from everyone, from your internet service provider or network administrator administrator to government sensors, and it's the most customizable on the market, letting you set custom rules for different websites and offering no bandwidth restrictions or speed throttling so you can stream, upload and download to your heart's content privately. And my favourite part is that it's 100% open source, so if you're one of those clever people who knows what you're actually looking at, it's easy to verify that everything is above board from the open GitHub repositories. No user data is stored and PIA's no log policy has been proven in court multiple times. So get your three year subscription with four extra months absolutely free for only $1.98 a month. That's 83% off only by visiting privateinternetaccess.com forward slash iCaveDave as this offer is exclusive for you guys and it's risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee and 24 seven customer support. So why wait? So yeah, finally, a quick personal update. As I mentioned very briefly earlier, uh, my previous job has now come to an end. So I am uh, in <laughs> in between jobs for a little bit. Um, but don't worry, the channel's not going anywhere. There might be some disruption to the videos. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is the 941 podcast that I've been doing with Saran is really hard to do at the minute when there's no news. Um, it's okay to, for me to do these things where we can compile all the questions over a couple of days. Um, but... To, to try and do a live show when there's no news is really difficult. So we're going to take a bit of a sabbatical. Uh, we're probably going to come back when there are pre-event hypes to do uh, and things like that. But if you've got any other ideas for what you would like to see on that podcast channel, let me know and uh, we'll, we'll take a look. But for now, probably going to leave it for a little bit. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next one.